So I have created this class and I have created a function called heapsock. So this heapsock, if you recall the pseudocode, the first step that we're going to do is called build max heap. So we'll just implement this function called build max heap. Let's put this logic in place first. This is the first step. Next step after that, what we what we did is that we went from the last element of this valid max heap all the way up to the second element of this input array, right? What we did is that we first do a swap. So let me first get the heap size. I'll call it heap size. It's going to be array length minus one. It's going to be the length of the array minus one. And then we'll have a for loop starting from heap size all the way down to the second element, which is why i needs to be greater than zero. And then i minus minus, we go all the way down. So the first step in the for loop, what we did is that we swap the last element in the valid max heap with the root node. So what we will do is we'll swap this i with zero, with the position in the root node. So that's the first step. Next step, don't worry about the compilation error. I'm going to implement all of these methods in just a few seconds. Let me put the main logic into place first. Next, what we did is that we decrement the size of the heap by one, which means we cut off the edge. So let's decrement the size of the heap by one. So then we have the element to be put in the correct position by cutting off the edge to the last node in the valid max heap. The third step or the last step of this for loop is we call max heapify. So let me write this function called max heapify. So a few parameters that we're going to take in. First is the array. The second is going to be the parent index, which in this case is going to be zero, which is the root node. That's the index to begin with. And then the second parameter that we need is going to be the size of the heap, which means the upper boundary in terms of the array representation that we can reach. So we'll put heap size here. You'll see why in just a few short seconds. In the end, we can simply just return the original array, which is going to be guaranteed that this output is sorted in ascending order. Now, let's implement these three functions. This one is pretty simple. Uh, let me just create this heap sort i and j. In C++, there is a swap function built in, but in Java, we have to implement this. Very simple, three lines. Array i. This is basically to help us swap the two elements indexed as i and j to swap values. Then we can safely override this one with the value at index j and then we assign this temp value to the value at position j that's swap function now let's implement build max heap this build max heap is what we just went through we given a randomly ordered array how we can build a max heap in our visual representation but in reality in the actual code in the logic is still operating man manipulating on the simple 1d array all right now let's see so what we did is we just went from, if you recall, we start from the last element of the first half. We go all the way to the first element. So we'll start from half minus one, all the way down to the first element. That's why we have i is greater than or equal to zero because we need the first element. So this is cutting the length of the array by half. So suppose the length, in our example, the length of the array is 10. So 10 divided by two is five, five minus one is four. And in actual code, all array indices start from zero. So the first five elements is going to be indexed from zero all the way up to four. So the last element of the first half is four. So we start from four all the way down to zero. That's what it means. Now, inside this, what do we do? We call this function max. All right, let me just put it here. We call max heapify. So max heapify, we take in these parameters array. So the first element is going to be i, and the second element is going to be the size of the heap, which in this case is going to be this entire array length. Length minus one. 
So I put it this way, you can put it either without minus one or with minus one. It doesn't matter as long as you implement max hippify properly. So now let's implement max hippify. What the first parameter really means is, is the parent index. I'll to make it more descriptive and more meaningful, call it parent index. Because if you recall in our slides that we just went through, when we call max hippify, all of the elements in the second half of the original given input, they are all leaves, right? That means we're always running max hippify on parents only. If this node doesn't have any children, there's no point to run max hippify. We're actually building a max heap by running max hippify on the parents. Next, what does the second parameter represent? The second parameter represents the size of the heap. So in this case, we'll just call it index limit, which means if you go beyond the index limit, those are not part of the valid remainder part of this valid heap that we are iterating on already. They have already been cut off. So that's what it means. Now, inside this max heap, what do we do? We try to compare with its left and right children. So this is where the three formulas that we just went through comes in very handy, which means how can we get the child indices from the parent index? We need to get both left and right children. So we'll just call it left child index in this case, which is going to be parent index times two plus one. Remember, in the actual code, all array indices start from zero. So here, left child is going to be plus one. And let me just copy this. And, and the right child index is going to be parent index times two plus two. This is the actual representation in actual code. So what we would like to do in this function, in this max hippify function, is to check whether this subtree is a valid max heap by checking if the node with the value at the root is actually greater than both of its left and right children, right? So we'll just call a max index. In the beginning, we'll just assume parent index is bigger than both of its left and right children. Then we'll check, we'll check left first. If left, if left child index is smaller than or equal to index limit, and which means it's within the valid boundary of this heap, of the size of the heap. And if array left child index is, if it's greater than array parent, if it's greater than this, which means the left child is greater than the parent, that means the max index should be left child index, right? We can check the right child. So if right child index is smaller than or equal to index limit, again, we need to check if it's within the valid heap size, the valid heap boundary first. And then if array right child index is greater than array in this case we'll just call max index because it could be it could have been changed because it could have been changed because by this one it could be it could have gone through this if that is the case we'll just use the max index to compare if the right side index is greater than the max index the value pointed by the max index then we're just going to assign the right child in the right child index to be the max index. At this point, max index could have been updated by, by this branch or by this branch. So what we want to check is if max index is not equal to parent index. What that means is that, okay, this is not a valid max heap because either the left or the right child of this current root node is greater than the root node. So what we need to do is that we need to swap. We need to swap this, the value at max index with the value at parent index. This is what we need to do. And after this swap, the node at index max index is not guaranteed to be a still a valid max heap. So at this point, what we need to do is to call max hippify array max index and index limit. This is what we need to call. So this is a recursive function. This one is calling itself at this point until it reaches the case when what? When this one equals to this, then we're done, right? All right, this is the entire function. Now let me hit run and see how it's going to work.
All right, no compilation errors. Now the result seems to be valid. I hope this makes sense and I'll put the code into my GitHub and I'll put a link to my GitHub repo down in the description box below. So I highly encourage you guys to check it out and play around with the actual code and set breakpoints in this code so that you can really understand how Heapsaw really works behind the scenes. Okay, with all of that said, let's just quickly revisit the time complexity of Heapsaw. Best case, worst case, average, average case is all O n log n. For the best case, there's a trivial case, which is when all of the keys are not the same. So the best case is going to be O n, which is very trivial, which really defeats the purpose of sort. If it's all equal, why do we sort anyways, right? So ignore that trivial case, all of the best, worst, and average cases is going to be O n log n. Space complexity wise, it's going to be O 1. Why is O 1? Didn't we use a tree? No, actually the binary tree or the max heap is just a visual representation to help us understand. If you look at our code, you can see that we only used indices to manipulate on the array. We never initialized any extra temporary data structure to help us do the sorting work, right? All right, heap data structure is a very powerful data structure. By itself, it's not only very practical in helping us implementing heap sort, it has a lot of very practical applications. For example, priority queue is backed by heaps. So there are two types of priority queues. One is max priority queue, which is backed by max heap. In real world, how do you schedule different jobs on the shared computer based on priority, right? So the ones with the highest priority is going to be scheduled and, and executed first, and then the next highest priority, then the third highest priority, right? The second priority queue is minimum priority queue, which is of course backed by minimum heap. A real world application could be an event driven simulator. So all of the items in the queue are events to be simulated. Each of these event is associated with a time of occurrence that serves as its key. For example, the events must be simulated in the order of their time of occurrence because the simulation of an event can cause other events to be simulated in the future. So Minimum priority queue is a good data structure to help us implement that. These are just a few simple real world applications. Again, this is the code. This is the actual Java code, which is working. I'll put a link to my GitHub to this code. I highly encourage you guys to check it out, play around with it to help you deeply understand it. So if you like this video and you find this video is really helpful to help you understand Heapsort, and this is a very cool data structure and algorithm please do me a favor and gently tap the like button. That's going to help a lot with the YouTube algorithm. And also don't forget to subscribe to my channel as we continue to go through a lot of interesting data structure and algorithm problems. And I have accumulated quite a few on my playlist. So feel free to check it out. I'll see you guys in just a few short seconds. And also feel free to comment and share on this video with your friends, classmates, colleagues. If you have any questions or comments, just comment down below in the comment section. I really appreciate it. That's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.